1 John chapter number 3, and we're going to start reading in verse number 18 tonight, 1 John 3 and verse number 18. Talking about a subject, hopefully it'll be a help uh, to us, uh, just the thought of assurance through loving obedience. And I, I think if we're honest with ourselves, we would say that uh, maybe at some point in the past or maybe even currently, some struggle with assurance of their salvation. Am I really saved? How, how come I don't feel like I'm saved? Well, one of the reasons why John writes uh, this epistle, uh, 1 John, is, is to give us some, some help, some understanding about assurance of salvation, how we can know for sure that we're saved. And so 1 John chapter number 3, if you found verse 18, if you'll stand, if you're physically able to do so, let's uh, honor the reading of God's Word tonight. 1 John 3, verse number 18, he writes and says, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart. Praise the Lord for that. And knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. Let's pray. Lord, we need your help to understand. We need your help to, to learn about what your truth is so that we can have confidence uh, in the Lord. Thank you for salvation. Help us, please. If there's someone that's struggling tonight with an assurance of their salvation or is a little bit uncertain, then, Lord, I pray that this passage would give some clarity. But I can't do that in and of myself, so I'm asking that you, your Holy Spirit, would have a full and free reign. You'd guide every word. And, Lord, please help us to hear what we need to hear. And then again, give understanding, give clarity. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. All right, so turn back to the very first word in 1 John chapter number 3. All right, the very first word in 1 John chapter number 3 is what? Behold, all right? Some of you are there, some of you are not sure, but it's behold. It means to see with your eyes, to, to inspect something, to, to, to know that it's, it's there. And what is it in verse number one? What are we supposed to behold? What are we supposed to see with our eyes? The, the love of God, right? Do you see that? Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. So I'm supposed to behold, I'm supposed to be able to see with my eyes the manner of love that the Heavenly Father has given to me. Look at verse two. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that, when he shall, what's the word? Appear, right? To, to be able to see. We shall see him as he returns to gather us home to heaven. Why? Because he loves us, right? He, he loves us. He's given his son. His son died on the cross for our sins, and he was buried and rose again the third day. And because of that, he is coming again for us because he, he loves us. Look at verse 5, 1 John 3, verse 5. And ye know that he was, what's that word? manifested. It's all basically the same idea. He was made visible to take away our sins. Why? Because he loves us. He perfectly knows that there's no possible way that, that a human being can rid, we can't rid ourselves of, of any sin, right? There's nothing I can do that washes away or takes away even like that little white lie you told in the third grade. I know you told one in the third grade. I told one too. I can't do any amount of good works to even take away that one sin. I can't, I can't do that. Because God knows that, verse 5, ye know that he was manifested. He, he was made visible to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Okay, so as John begins this, this chapter, 1 John chapter number 3, there's three separate times. Just what we saw, he's writing about the love of God being visible toward us. His love was made apparent to the world. Not just us, but it's made apparent to the world. Why? Because he loves us. He wants to us to, to see it with our own eyes. All right? Question. Are we 
supposed to love God? Yes, yes, we, we, that's what we're supposed to do. Okay, follow-up question. Are we supposed to love other people? Yes, good, I'm glad you got both of those right. We're supposed to love God, we're supposed to love other people. So, so how can other people understand that we love God and that we love them? By the way, we talked a little bit about it this morning as well, right? We show them. God showed his love to us by manifesting his son, Jesus Christ. I show my love for God, I show my love for others by manifesting that, by making it visible to God, to other people, okay? So here's where we take a little bit of a transition as we come into verse number 18 where we read this evening. One of the, one of the greatest forms of discouragement for the Christian person is harboring some amount of doubt about their salvation, right? And if you've ever been there, if you've ever had a doubt about your salvation, if you've ever wondered, boy, I don't feel saved, that, that's, that can be a real struggle. Right? That, that can be a crushing blow, to be quite honest. It's, it, it's, it's a constant wondering about the forgiveness of my sins and the salvation of my soul. And if that doubt isn't dealt with, it causes me to live with defeat in my life. I, I don't come with any amount of confidence toward God. I, I don't even step out to try to accomplish something for God because it, I just, I have this heavy weight on me that's like, well, I, I'm not even sure if I am saved. I'm not even sure if my sins have been forgiven. I, I don't feel like I'm saved. Well, John understood this is a reality in the life of any Christian person. Is a person less of a Christian or are they, they less important or, or are they a weaker brother or sister if they have this doubt in their life? Not necessarily. I think what John is saying is I, I understand that if you're struggling with this, that can be a real, real issue in your life. But if you are, realize that the truth of the matter, that God loves you. He has shown his love for you. And there are some ways that you can um, test yourself. You can put these little evaluations on your own life and say, is, is this where I am? Is this what I have done? And if I have done that, then I have to rest in the truth that what God said is absolutely true. Even if I don't feel saved, I can know that I am saved. All right? So what is usually the cause of doubt of our salvation? What, what usually causes that? Well, I think the biggest cause is a misunderstanding of the gospel. Such as, I either, one, think that I have to work for my salvation. Do you think that can cause doubt? Uh, yeah. Um, I grew up in a, a way of believing that said, uh, yes, it's by grace, but you have to then kind of keep your salvation by continuing to do good things. If you're not doing good things, you must not be saved, or you must have lost your salvation, and you need to re-enlist, so to speak. Well, do you know what that caused you to do? It caused you to question everything that you did. Well, did I cross the line by doing that? Or does grace cover that sin? If I told five lies, am I still saved? But if I told six, you understand that that's a problem. And the, it, it, it causes you and I to draw lines where the Bible doesn't draw lines. Right? And so I'm never quite sure if I am or if I'm not. Now, um, does it help you as, uh, I, I'm just going to be bare bones honest, does it help the preacher to try to preach a guilt-ridden message, to try to bring a decision? Yeah. If you're not doing what I say you should do, or if you're not doing what we say or think you should do, then you probably need to come forward and, and give your life back over to the Lord. You need to re-up. You need to, to, to re-trust Christ for salvation once again. And so there's this constant flow of decisions that are made, and you get the same person saved five times in a year. Well, that's not what the Bible talks about as salvation. That's not eternal life, as the Bible says calls it. So a cause of doubt comes from a misunderstanding of the gospel, a, a misconception of the truth of God's word that brings about a wrong way of thinking in my life, okay? So either one, I think, well, works saves me or works keeps me saved, or the thought of if I am sinning, if I have sinned, I must not be saved, right? And that's where most Christians kind of dwell in is, 
well, I did that sin. I must not be saved, so I must have to try to do it right this time. Well, am I saved because I got the right combination of words in the little prayer that I said? No, no. Um, I will say it like this when I'm, I'm witnessing to somebody or trying to lead them to the Lord. Because oftentimes people, they struggle, especially if they haven't prayed before. Well, what do I do? How do I say it? Well, let me ask you this. If you were to get thrown out of a boat and you're in the midst of a stormy sea, what would you yell? Help! Does it matter how loud you yell help? In what language you yell help or in some manner that really, well, they really must want help because they said it in that way. No, it's just an, and I called out for help. So it's not in the combination of words or, well, I used sanctification and uh, glorification and forgive. I used all those words in my prayer, so then I must be saved. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says I must understand that I'm a sinner. I must confess or think the same as or agree with God about my sin. And I just flat out tell him that. Lord, you said I'm a sinner and I agree. I also have to understand what Jesus Christ has done for me in my place. He died uh, on the cross. He shed his blood for me. He lived a righteous life. He was buried after he, he died. He rose again the third day. All for me. And if I put my trust in him for forgiveness and for salvation, then the Bible says I'm saved. I can't add anything to it. I can't take anything away from it. Um, is it easy to be saved? I say, yes, God's made it easy for you to be saved. You can easily trust Christ. Does that mean that repentance or, or a, a confession of sin is, is not, uh, not a part of it? No, no, I think repentance is a part of salvation. I have to change my mind about that. But the thing is, it's pretty simple for me to understand. I'm a sinner like everybody else, but Jesus Christ lived perfectly, died perfectly, and can save me perfectly. So this doubt can manifest itself or show itself in several areas. But in the passage that we read tonight, John is going to deal specifically with the issue of our love. How are we loving God? How are we loving other people? How is our love displayed in our actions? And so the deeds that we do, like our actions, our thoughts, our words, our attitudes, or the deeds we do not do, maybe because of rebellion, maybe because of laziness, maybe because of selfishness. What are all those things speaking about in my faith toward God? And a lack of assurance is something that, that most of the time, not always, but most of the time, we bring on ourselves. Because I'm not, I'm not maybe living as I should be, or I'm not showing love for God as I should be. I'm not showing my salvation as I ought to be. And so because of that, again, I don't feel saved. That's on us. Now, can somebody preach a message and make me feel like a low-down, dirty louse? Yeah, I've been in a few of those sermons too, right? It's sad to say, and just be honest, I probably preached a few of those, right? But understand, God is wanting me to know, to know in my heart and have an assurance of my salvation. That's what he wants in my life. He doesn't want me to go around doubting and uncertain of my salvation. He wants me to know. John would say in chapter number five, these are written that ye might know that ye have eternal life. God desires us to know that we're saved. So he's going to give us some help in understanding how we can know. In 1 John 3, verses 18 through 24, here's the, the issue. Salvation assurance comes through something like loving obedience. Do I find myself loving God and because I'm loving him, I am found in obedience to him? Now, we're not talking, I want to be very clear up front, we're not talking about some legalistic form of obedience. That's, that's not what we're, we're striving for. And I don't believe that's what John is talking about. We'll talk about that here in just, just a moment. But loving obedience, I obey because 
I love. So here's where John starts beginning in verse number 18. He says, first, we must love through action, not just through the words that we speak. All right? Um, as we read through the chapter, it's all about this display of love. Go back in chapter 3, look at verse number 7. All right? we, we've looked at verse 1, look at verse 2, look at verse 5. Look at verse number 7, 1 John chapter 3. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. So how do I know if I'm doing righteousness? Well, that's going to come out in my actions. Right? It's going to be visible for someone to see. Look at verse number 10. In this, the children of God are manifest, made visible, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Now, again, let's be reminded just one more time. We're not talking about one act. We're talking about a continuing action of doing unrighteousness. That person does not have God dwelling in their heart. Right? But if I if I am slipping into sin or if I'm choosing uh, to, to sin in, in some instance, well, it's not necessarily that I'm not saved because I have ver verses like 1 John chapter number 1 and verse number 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. If we confess our sins, verse 9, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. All right? So we're talking about that habitual, continual person who is not acting in a righteous manner. Look at verse 16. Hereby, here's another word that John uses. Hereby perceive we, we can see the love of God because he laid down his life for us. Because of that, we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. All right, so all of these things are, are talking about a love that is seen or a love for self that manifests itself in unrighteousness. Selfish deeds, perhaps, okay? So then look back at verse number 18, chapter number three. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Is John saying, don't tell somebody you love them? No, that's ridiculous. He's saying, don't just make it words. Love in words and also in your actions, Show people that you love them. Again, we, we talked a little bit about that this morning. I can easily talk about a need that I see. Here's how we can love on sister so-and-so. Here's how we can love brother who's it's, what's it's, whatever his name is. All right, fill in the blank. But if we don't do anything about it, are we really loving them? No, we just talked about it. And oftentimes why we just stop at talking about it is, is that soothes our conscience a little bit. Because again, we've made it more about our conscience than we have about actually doing what God would have us to do. And so God says many times that, that he loved us. God showed he loves us, how? By giving us his son. John three sixteen. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. How about Romans uh, 5 and verse number 8? But God commendeth, that word literally means showed, God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Look at verse 16 again, 1 John 3. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. I mean, just time and time and time again, God states he loved us and because he loved us, this is what he did for us. Right? So in verse number 18, then, there seems to be some implication that if we only say we love somebody, but we don't do anything about that love, then we're not really telling the truth. I love so-and-so. But if I'm not showing that love, if I'm not doing something about that love, I'm not really loving them. I'm just speaking the words. And words can be very empty. Obedience to God is not complete in words alone. Obedience to God is complete when I act upon it. Let me just give you a simple example. Have you ever asked your children if they brushed their teeth before they went to bed? I do. Every night. You know why? Because they're little liars. And they don't always brush their teeth. And so, what do I have to do? I want to see your teeth. And if they're gross and yellow and they got stuff crawling in them, you didn't brush your teeth. You lied. 
You can say, yes, I brush my teeth. But the proof is in the, some of you know, pudding, pudding. I'm talking about food here, pudding. Brush your teeth if you eat pudding, all right? Are you saying, I love someone? Are you saying, I care about this, this thing or this person, but are you doing something about it? Do your actions back up what your words have to say? Jesus spoke about loving others enough to serve them. In fact, um, Brother Doug brought up this verse uh, this morning once again. And it is a, it's a great verse, but hold your place in 1 John. Go back to the Gospel of John in verse number 13. John 13. Brother Doug knows where I'm going. John 13, verse 17. How do I show people that I love them? I show them by serving them. The context of John 13 is Jesus is getting ready to reveal some of, more of the plan that he is going to be crucified. He is going to leave the disciples. Do you know how he begins that conversation in John 13? He girds a towel around himself and he gets down on his knees and he washes their feet. And he talks about serving one another. And as I, the master, served you, I'm showing you how you are to love other people. Okay? So the context of John 13 is serving others because of love. Look at John 13 and verse number 17. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. And it's not uh, doing the cool stuff that everybody wants to do. It's getting down and dirty and serving other people. And if you'll do that, if you will yield to God in that, if you will find yourself serving other people and loving other people, what does God himself say will happen in your life? You will be, what's the word? Happy. Anyone want to say that? I don't want to be happy. Teenagers, you're not included in this. No, we all want to be happy. The Bible tells us how we can be happy is by getting involved in serving other people, in loving them. Happy are ye if ye do them. Okay, now back in 1 John chapter number 3. Look at verse 19. This is kind of John continuing the thought of verse number 18. Serving God and others in love is a way that God tells us we can gain assurance of a relationship with God. Verse 19, hereby we, what's the word? No, that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. How? If we're found doing, verse number 18, not just loving in word or in tongue, but in deed, in truth. When I do those things, what God brings in my heart is an assurance. You're doing this because you love them. That's part of being saved. I gain assurance of, of Christ dwelling in me, the Holy Spirit dwelling in me when I will serve other people in love. Not serving other people so that I'll get something out of it. That's the opposite of what we're talking about. It's serving other people in love. And when I will do that, you know what the Holy Spirit does in my heart? It's right there in verse number 19. It gives me an assurance. It gives me confidence. God is working in me. God is not working in the heart of someone who God doesn't dwell in their heart. He dwells where he, or he works where he dwells. Commentator John Phillips, one of my favorites, he said this, good works are not the ground of our conversion. They are the result of it. Good works are not what my salvation is based on. They are a result of my salvation. So how do we deal then with our doubt? Well, Here's what John says, verses 19 and 20. John says, I can have salvation, or, or rather gain an assurance of my salvation through the knowledge of God, through the knowledge of his truth. Again, verse 19. Hereby we know, that's a good verse to underline or highlight or circle. We know that we are of the truth and shall assure, that's another good word, our hearts before him. If our heart, what? Condemn us. God is greater than our heart. 
and knoweth all things. Verse 20 is a tremendous verse. When I don't feel like it, God knows better than what I feel like. When I'm not um, into it, I'm not, eh, well, yeah, back to church. I'm saved. I just might be tempted to stay home. <laughs> well, God knows that I'm saved even when I don't feel like I'm saved or I'm not necessarily even acting maybe like I'm saved. Are we talking about a false assurance? No, I don't think so. I think that um, you will know if you're saved. You, you know what you have done. Have you understood your sin? Have you trusted in Christ for salvation? You would know if you've done that. And if not, you can do that today. <laughs> you can get it settled today. But the feelings can, can, and emotions can, can sometimes get the best of us. But when I know what God has said in his word, when I understand the truth of the matter, when I see what God says about it rather than what I feel about it, then that, again, it helps me to have assurance in my heart. Well, if that's what he said, then he's the truth. Again, hold your place in 1 John. Turn back to Psalm 19. Old Testament, Psalm 19. Psalm 19, look at verse number 7. I read this recently in my own personal devotions, and it just, man, it was such a help. I, I want to uh, write a sermon uh, just from this little portion of Scripture. Psalm 19, look with me at verse number 7, and we're talking again about God's Word. Here's what the psalmist said. The law of the Lord, what's the law of the Lord? The Scripture, right? The, the Bible. The law of the Lord is perfect. What does it do? Converts the soul. How can I know how to be saved? From God's word. Look at the next one. The testimony of the Lord. That's another phrase for the Bible or the scripture. The testimony of the Lord is sure. So what does it do? It makes wise the simple. When I don't know what to know, God's word helps me to know what I should know. Look at the next. Again, the scripture, the Bible, the commandment of the Lord is pure. So what does it do? It enlightens my eyes. It helps me to see what I couldn't see before. It, it is truth to me. It is light. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. The fear of the Lord is what? Clean. So what does that mean? It endures how long? Forever. Again, the judgments of the Lord. All of this is about the Bible, the Scripture. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Question, can that last phrase be said about your emotions? No. No. Feelings come and feelings go and feelings are deceiving. I'll place my trust in the Word of God. Not else is worth believing. It's true and righteous altogether. So as I get to know this book, as I hide God's word in my heart, I begin to learn about who my God is. I begin to understand that salvation is about him. It's about me relying on him wholly for what only he can do. And as I do that, my love for him grows. Oh, you mean I don't have to work for it? I don't have to, to, to prove my love so that you'll love me back? No, he already loves me. When I was unlovely, he loved me. And because of that, I now want to love him. And so as I come to read and know God's word, I'm learning more about God himself. And guess what also happens? My conscience, what, what God has given to me, my conscience is also being informed. It is being framed, so to speak, so that I learn from God's word what I should do and what I shouldn't do. And there may be times, again, when I don't feel saved. Verse 20, 1 John chapter number 3. But God knows the reality of the matter. And as I come to know him better, I realize that salvation is about my feelings. It's about his truth. And because it's about his truth, then I have to take what he said at his word. He is true and righteous altogether. What did he say? John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So I, I can examine my own heart. I, I can look into my own life and I find pride and anger and bitterness and resentment and lust and rebellion, all of those things. And so when I, I see myself and I see my sin, I can be very prone to wonder if I'm saved at all. Well, if I have these things, how can I be saved? And at such times, what John is writing and what God is trying to, to, to get us to understand is that he is greater than our heart. That salvation is not dependent on how I feel, but it's dependent on him, his work in my life. Okay, so that's one side. Now let's flip it over and go to verse number 21. Here's the other side. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. And what happens when I have confidence toward God? Thank you for asking. Keep reading verse number 22. When I have confidence, whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. Because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. When I have confidence of my salvation, when I have confidence of God working in my life, what does it bring about in my life? It brings about boldness to approach God. Because of what Jesus has done, I can now approach God and give him the requests of my heart. I can tell him what is troubling me, where, where doubt is creeping in. All of those things I can offload on him because I have boldness. He's my heavenly father. My father did not, um, he, he didn't go a lot with us to the grocery store because he didn't want to be pestered for stuff that we asked him for. <laughs> Dad, can I have this, can I have this, can I have this, can I have this? Every aisle, every aisle. You know that aisle where there's like flour and spices and stuff that no kid 10 years old possibly needs? <laughs> Dad, can I have this? Dad, can I have this? Dad, can I have that? I mean, every aisle there was something. You know how I had freedom to ask? Now, I, I probably knew I wasn't going to get it, but he was my dad. I didn't ask the stranger in the cart next to us. He's not my dad. But I could ask my heavenly father. I could ask my earthly dad because I had a privilege that no one else had. I have a heavenly father that I have been given privileged access to because of what Jesus Christ has done for me. And when I have confidence about my salvation, verse 21, when my heart isn't condemning me, when, I'm, when I understand the truth of the matter, I can approach God with boldness. But when I'm doubting my relationship with the Lord, it's often the case that I'm not fellowshipping with Him, I'm not communicating with Him. But assurance brings confidence that He does love me, He does desire to hear from me. And as I learn about him, that is, as I learn his truth, I grow to love him, and that love is going to show itself, verse 18, in the things that I do. Boy, he loved me, and this is what he did for me. And because I love him, this is what I want to do for him. He teaches me. This, this is an important thought. And, and this is, is important for something like a marriage relationship or a relationship with your children, a relationship with, with your coworkers or your other family members. Understand this, God teaches me in his word how I can love other people. I'm so bad at loving people, I have to be told time and time again, you need to love them. You need to love your spouse. Now, see, we would think, well, that, shouldn't that come naturally? Well, the Bible doesn't think so because it keeps telling me over and over and over again, right? Hey, you need to love that woman. You need to love that husband. You need to love those kids, Ugh. right? Because we're, we're, we're just not good at it. Assurance comes through loving obedience. My, my actions are gonna prove love, not just words, but in my actions. Here's thought number two. Beginning in verse 21, then our prayer is shaped by God's will. If you don't have assurance of your salvation, I can say this, it's hard to pray. It's hard to pray when I'm not sure if I'm saved or not. Right? It's hard for me to approach God. And in verse number 21, that word confidence means literally boldness. 
The word means without concealment or freedom of speech. I love what what A.T. Robertson, who was a great scholar in, in, in the wording in the New Testament, here's what he said. It describes the privilege of coming before someone of great importance and power with the freedom to express what is on your mind. In other words, you don't hold anything back. That's the confidence that we're talking about in verse number 21. I'm approaching God. I'm not holding back on him. Ephesians 3.12. Maybe this came up in your mind as we were talking about it just a moment ago. In whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. How about Hebrews 4 and verse number 16. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So what John is saying here, as we have assurance or confidence of our salvation, because we've examined our hearts, we're learning about who God is, about what God says about us and about his love for us, as we're loving others through the Lord and we're loving through our deeds, then we understand the blessing of watching, verse 22, God then answer our prayer. And here's how it comes about. John said in verse number 22, as we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in God's sight, here's what he does with my requests. Here's my requests. Here's his will. As I'm obeying him and learning about him and drawing closer to him, my requests, my desires become what he already wanted for me in the first place. So this stuff that I thought I really wanted that's not what I really need. What I need is what God needs me to have or wants me to have. What he wants me to learn to realize this son is what you actually need. So John says in verse number 22, I have confidence. I approach God. I have boldness to, to bring my request to him. As I'm obeying his commands, as I'm loving others, my desires are becoming what his desires are for me. And you know the kind of prayers that God loves to answer? Our prayers according to his will. So my will becomes his will. And John says, this is another way that you can gain assurance. When your desires are beginning to kind of fall by the wayside and your desires are becoming God's desires for your life. I find delight in the Lord. As I find delight in the Lord, he is shaping my desire, my will Because he knows what is absolutely best for my life. He loves to answer those prayers. Um, What time is it? I want you to see this. Look at John 15. John 15. Hold your place in 1 John. Look back at John 15. John 15. Look at verse number 7. I want you to see this. John 13. Serve others. Right? John 14, don't be discouraged, don't be fearful, I'm preparing a place for you, there's coming another comforter. John 15 is abide in the vine. Right? So John 15, look at verse number 7. If ye abide in me, and my words abide, dwell in, that they found their residence in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Why? Is this um, name it and claim it? No. No, in fact, it's the opposite of that. It's realizing you don't need a private jet to travel the world. You need to trust me that I'll provide exactly what you need. Look at verse number 10, John 15. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. Question, where did Jesus ever go out of the Father's will? Yeah, good. You're silent. That's one time I want you to be silent. Because no time. Never. Now, please be silent on this. But where do you or when do you find yourself out of God's will. Well, usually when I'm not walking with him. 
usually when I'm not doing as much learning from his word or the reading that I am doing is just kind of a cursory get it done and over with so I can get to something else that I really want to do. John 15 is about abiding in Christ, dwelling in him. As I'm drawing close to him, again, his desires are becoming my desires. He answers those kind of prayers. Psalm 37, verse number four. Don't turn there. Let me read it to you. Now listen to what the psalmist said. 37, four of Psalm. Delight thyself also in the Lord. Do you know the rest of it? And he shall give thee, what? The desires of thine heart. The desires of my heart will be God's desires when I delight myself in him. Do you see how all that comes together? When I delight in the love of God, my desire becomes the will of God. And confidence in God, John says, causes me to pray for big things that only God can deliver. I have to give him those requests. Only he can do this. But confidence in God also causes me to pray about the very small things in life because there's nothing too small that escapes his view for me. So I can bring him the big stuff I can also bring him the small stuff. And I do it with confidence. Why? Because he loves me to care enough about the big stuff in my life and the small stuff in my life. I hope you can see how much your God loves you. Boldness in prayer because of a reliance on God's truth is evidence of a changed heart. Let's finish up real quickly. Here's number three. John says in verses 23 and 24, we become reliant on the truth of God's instruction and provision. So on the heels of verse number 22, right? His commandments, John gives us there, there's a twofold command in verse number 23. Because we keep his commandments, verse number 22, what are the commandments? Well, look at verse number 23. And this is his commandment. Number one, that we should believe on the name of the, his son, Jesus Christ. Here's commandment number two and love one another. Is that difficult for anybody to see? Hopefully not. Is it difficult for anybody to do? Yeah. Yeah, it's not as difficult to put my trust in Jesus Christ. It's a little bit more difficult to do the second one, love other people. But what I'm doing is I'm following God's command. Jesus would say the same thing in Matthew 22. You remember that lawyer that comes to try to trip up Jesus and he asks him, uh, what, what is the great, greatest commandment? What does Jesus say? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. And thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. These are the greatest commandments. All right? So faith toward God and love toward my fellow man sums up my Christian obligation. All right? Uh, Galatians 5, 6. Here's what Paul would say. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision. It's not about the outward works. Here's what it is. But faith which worketh by love. That's my obligation as a Christian, is that I would work by the love of God. So here's what we're saying. Is doctrine important? Yes. Oh, yes. Is love important? Yes, yes. I don't separate those two. But what happens in a majority of church life today is we're either heavy on the doctrine and low on the love or we're heavy on the love and low on the doctrine. And either way draws us away from what God really would have us to do. But when what God is saying is if I will understand and know the doctrine and if I will love other people, that's being in the will of God. Both doctrine and love are important. And so verse number 23, I want you to see this and we'll finish up. This is his commandment that we should believe. That verb right there, believe, is in a past tense, so to speak. So in other words, it took place at one point in the, in the past. It's already been done, right? So I have believed on the name of his son, Jesus Christ. That's already been taken care of. But now the next verb here, and love, love is in the present tense. 
I've already believed on Jesus. So now what happens, because I believed, and that's a one-time event, it's already happened in the past, then I presently, like right now, and right now, and right now, and right now, and right now, I love other people. Okay? So what a past action does, <coughs> excuse me, trusting Christ, brings me to love others just constantly, continually. That's the way I should be living my life. Because I have trusted, it produces a continuing action of my will, choosing to love my neighbor. And the life that God gives to us when we believe, is it eternal? Yes, yes. Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is what? Death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's eternal. It's everlasting. Okay, so look at then the last verse, verse number 24. The word dwelleth, that, that John used there, and he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him. That is the exact same word that Jesus used in John 15. Remember what the word is? Abide. As you're abiding in me, as you're dwelling in me, as you're communing, we can use that, in Christ. He that keepeth his commandments dwelleth, abideth in him. To remain in him. The moment I trust Christ, I enter into union with God. Never to be broken. But my communion with God, maintaining that, dwelling or abiding, is a moment-by-moment -moment responsibility on me. Because God's not doing the leaving. I'm the one doing the leaving. If I'm not dwelling, it's not God's fault. It's my fault. Because I'm not being obedient to what he wants me to do. So I abide. Here's what John says. I abide. I dwell in Christ when I'm walking in obedience to his will. Our fellowship is contingent upon our obedience. But when we choose to commit an act of sin and we break God's law, that's 1 John 3 and verse number 4. When I choose to break that fellowship, I'm doing so temporarily. But my sonship, so to speak, is unaffected by that. I, I'm telling you, one of my favorite stories in all the Bible is the story of the prodigal son. It's a tremendous, tremendous story. There, there's a lot that's there. But just think about the prodigal son. Did he ever cease to be the son? No. In his own heart, did he think he wasn't worthy of being the son? Yes. Remember what, that speech that he rehearsed before he went to his dad? I'm not worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy fellow servants. What did the father say? Go get the fatted calf. Put the best robe on him. Put a ring on his finger. My son was gone. Now he's come back. That's a picture of my Christianity. I'm the one that leaves my heavenly father, but he is always wanting me to come back to him. And what John is saying is, yes, when you don't feel saved, it is because you have gone away from the Father. It is not because the Father has gone away from you. Amen. And it doesn't have to be that way. You can dwell in Him. Verse 24, how can I know that? Because John says the Holy Spirit dwells in my heart. Amen. And it's been promised from God Himself. God dwells in me. We won't turn there for time. Let me give you some verses and we're done. Romans 8, verses 14 through 16. Go back and read Romans 8 about crying, Abba, Father, the sealing of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1, verses 13 and 14. Romans 8 and verse number 9. Romans 8, 14 through 16, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, Romans 8, 9. I'd encourage you to go back and read those. Again, it's talking about verse number 24, the Holy Spirit sealing you. He's never leaving you. He doesn't abandon you. You are sealed unto the day of redemption. That's what God does. But sanctification, and here's where we boil it down to. Here's what Brother Doug is talking about in our Sunday school class in the auditorium. Here's what the, the, these passages are talking about. Sanctification is a twofold work. First, it is the work of God in my life. There, there's part of it that only God can do. Only God can save me. 
Apart from the Holy Spirit at work in my life, I'm doomed. But number two, sanctification is also the work of the believer. I have to be yielding my life. I have to cooperate with the Holy Spirit's work in my life. Because every once in a while he says, hey Bubba, you need to stop doing that. Hey Bubba, you need to start doing this. And as I cooperate with the Holy Spirit at work in my life, I find myself in fellowship with God. I find my desires are, are being turned to his desires. I, I'm watching as my prayers become answered because I'm praying in God's will. And it helps me to, to, to understand there's an assurance that only God can give in my life. When I'm not close with God, I don't have assurance. But when I abide in Christ, you know what he does? He brings rest. But when I wander from him, it's just, it's constant exhaustion. Because I'm trying to catch up and, and get, get more in line with, with what I think I should do or what other people are telling me I should do. And I'm not doing what God tells me to do. Just abide in him. Can I have assurance? Yes. Yes. Don't let something else or someone else come in and try to steal that away. What John is saying is, it's not based on how you feel, it's based on what God has done in your life. Praise the Lord for that. Now I can walk in confidence because He loves me. And I can serve Him in love.